to walk in the life that the Lord Jesus Christ lived 1900 years ago do for you and for me today. You may never just have thought of it this way. The life he lived 1900 years ago condemns us as soundly as the Lord does. Then why did he live a life like that? That can only condemn us now. The answer is very simple. The life he lived qualified him for the death he died. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted for him. And God the just is satisfied to look on him condemned in the heart of me. He knew how wicked man had been. He knew that God must punish sin. So out of pity, Jesus said, I'll bear the punishment. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He suffered the just for the unjust to bring us to God. He was delivered for our offense. He was raised again for our justification. The Bible leaves us in absolutely no doubt whatever. He was wounded for our transgression and he was bruised for our iniquity. And it was the life that he lived that could only condemn us that qualified him for the death that he died. <laughs> that can't be deep. He paid the debt that we might go free. But that isn't the whole story. But may I ask you this question? Given that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Redeemer, who died for you historically 1900 years ago, once and for all, by this one sacrifice for sin forever, to reconcile you to a holy God, would you tell me this? Does the knowledge that your sins are forgiven for his dear sake in itself equip you for a life of God's life? Does the knowledge that your sins are forgiven because you have claimed Christ as your Redeemer, you have pleaded His precious blood, you've named His name, you've called upon Him, and you have been accepted by the Father in the Beloved, and your name has been inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life, with this rich assurance of your eternal destiny and security in itself impart to you any new capacity to live a different kind of life from the life that you lived before you were redeemed? I'm going to submit to you tonight that the knowledge that your sins are forgiven adds absolutely nothing to your spiritual capacity to be a different kind of person. It may create within you quite legitimately a holy ambition to be different. Out of a sense of gratitude and love and a sense of duty to the one who died for you because of an emotional attachment and a sentimental regard and a deep sense of loyalty, you will want to be different. But the knowledge that he died for you and your sins are forgiven because he died for you in itself does not impart to you any new spiritual caliber of living. And if all that Jesus Christ did when he came to this world 1900 years ago was to live that sinless life, to qualify him for that redeeming death, and then go straight back to heaven and simply wait till you got there. That wouldn't be much of a salvation. It would be a salvation that made you fit for heaven and left you hopelessly inadequate for earth. Yet all too often this is the gospel that is preached. Come to Jesus and have your sins forgiven. Now roll up your sleeves and show him how you love him. So we have to add a second statement. The first is the life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. But here is the second. The death that he died qualifies you to receive the life that he lived. That's the genius of the gospel. This is what, put, this is what puts heart into you. The life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. But the death that he died qualifies you as a forgiven, redeemed sinner, acquitted on a holy basis to become the recipient again, now in the present tense, of the life that he lived then, 1900 years ago.
So we discover that the life that he lived then can only condemn him. But isn't this really? It's the life that he lives now in you that saves you. And the Christian life is the life that he lived then. Live now by him in you. Because he is the only person capable of living that kind. This is the good news of the gospel. He is himself the dynamic of every demand he ever makes upon the redeemed system. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Christ in you. The hope of glory, the only hope. Now you can see what a wonderfully rich gospel it is we have to preach. You never invite anybody to come just for it, for him. You never invite anybody to come to Jesus just to get to heaven. There's only one valid reason why you and I should ever invite any man, woman, boy or girl to come to the Lord Jesus, and that is for the Lord Jesus. That he himself might step into their humanity and fill them with himself, so that their bodies might become temples of the living God. But we're quenching and frustrating and grieving the Spirit of God. Busy being ourselves when the one thing that the Father wants is for the opportunity for his God never intended you to be as a Christian any copy of anybody else. God never intended that you should be brought up with a pattern imposed upon you that brings you out in a certain mold. God redeemed your soul that your body might be inhabited by Jesus Christ himself. That the life he lived then might be lived now and how he lives his life is his business and nobody else. And your life will always be the perfect original of the divine expansive expression of the life of Jesus Christ. Imagine anything quite so thrilling as that. Not only a cross on the hill, but a cross in the heart. And for that young man or young woman on the threshold of life here tonight, I want to tell you this. That every horizon beckons you. Heavy golden reflection. If only you'll be prepared through death to allow his life to be released. To sign yourself away for God, in reckless abandon, become expendable, in complete, unquestioning availability to Jesus Christ. I cannot promise you what it will involve you, because I do not know. I know that He knows, for He knows the end from the beginning. And you and I are created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we, that we should walk in. It may give you six years to live for all I know. That's all it gave Stephen. Six months to live. It may give you a lifetime of suffering. It may send you to jail. If God wants to reach some poor, miserable sinner in some concentration camp, he has the right to put you there. Of course he has. Don't imagine that evangelists are simply men called to travel around the country in luxury. If God wants an evangelist in a concentration camp, he simply takes one member of his body who's learned to die and become expendable for God, and he puts him there. For three days or three years or thirty. And I wouldn't invite one man, woman, boy or girl to walk down any church to come to Christ who wasn't prepared for that quality of Christianity. I would consider it an insult to Jesus Christ. Because I want to tell you this, the life he lived qualified him for the death he died. But the death he died qualifies you exclusively for the life he lived. And he demands his Lordship. You not only rob yourself and impoverish yourself beyond all human description, but you rob him. As you claim your inheritance in Christ, fancy robbing Christ of his inheritance. This is normal Christianity. This isn't fanaticism. This is the quality of Christianity that evangelized the world in one known gener one one single generation. They didn't have jet planes. They had donkeys. They didn't have electronics. They didn't have loudspeaker systems. They were just flesh and blood inhabited by God. All right. Choose. Which would you like? Your picture or your life?
your children. Whatever picture may be you have painted, whatever dream you may have cherished, my invitation to you tonight is to die. Lord, of his hidden life, Christ, living in life.